that has become one of my favorite songs. Great words and great lyrics and good theology. You are in Hebrews 12, <clears throat> and I'd like for you to just hold your place right there a minute. Just hold your place. Let me read from Psalm 98 before we get to Hebrews 12 as we continue just this two-part series on worship. And I want to read one of the worshipful psalms for us to just preclude this message. And so hold your place there, but let me share with you from Psalm 98 what the psalmist says as he encourages us to worship our Lord. He says in Psalm 98, 1, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed in his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp and with the harp and the sound of singing with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and its people with equity. Isn't that a great text? What an encouragement to shout and to sing and to worship God, Jesus, our Savior, and give him the adoration and praise he deserves. Now in Hebrews 12, just one verse. I'm not lifting it out of its context. In fact, I would encourage you to go home and read this whole chapter in Hebrews 12, get the whole t context of what the writer's talking about. But in the, the idea of worship under the new covenant, he comes to a very applicable verse in Hebrews 12 and verse 28. He says, therefore, that means in light of the previous 27 verses. So I'd encourage you to go home and read those. He says, in light of what I've just said, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Worship God acceptably. Now, one of some of the older versions say worship God in a way that pleases him. So I can only deduce from that that not all worship pleases God. Not all worship pleases God. And I want to start today where I ended last Sunday in this series with a quote. A quote. I ended the message with this last Sunday, and I want to begin it today with that same quote. And I'm sorry, I don't have the reference for who said this. I came across it and wrote it down and forgot to put the name of who said it. But I think he's dead on. What's wrong with American worship? Our hearts don't know their need for Christ. We're not desperate. We're not broken. We don't approach Sunday with expectant, faith-filled, repentant hearts. We aren't hungry for Jesus. And as a pastor, as a Christian, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Often my heart is not hungry for Jesus. And when a heart is not hungry for Jesus, its worship is a low priority for it. But then I want to give you another quote by Stacy Lawson, a favorite preacher of mine. I'm sorry, Steve Lawson. There's a Stacey Lawson too. But Steve Lawson. Of course, in the average church where there is no ecclesiology, now ecclesiology is the doctrine of the church, and what he's saying by that comment is in an average church where church members so know virtually nothing about the doctrinal, the biblical doctrine of the church, 
Most don't understand the necessity of the church. All that matters is my personal relationship with Jesus. And we talked last week a bit about the vast differences in worship, especially here in America. We covered everything from traditional worship to snake handling last week. I got the snakes today to let you take part in that later. I'll not be here. Um, the fact is we are, we are designed for worship. God put in our DNA the desire to worship. Everyone has an altar. Everyone has an altar. Everyone has an altar. And I said this last week. If you want to know where your altar is, it's very simple. Just look at your calendar. Look at your checkbook. Look how you spend your time. Look how you spend your money. And you will find your altar. You will find your altar. And you worship at it. There is private and public worship. We talked about that last week. And certainly the Bible commends and commands private worship when it's just God and us, when we are alone with God. And that might be on a mountaintop, in the car, uh, in the house, piddling around, might be in the backyard, might be cutting grass. There are private times of worship where it's just us and God, individual worship between the creator and the creation and, and the the Bible commends it and commands that. But too many people want to end it there. They say, oh, I can, I can worship God anyway. I can worship in the mountains, and you can. I can worship God at the lake. Yes, you can. And actually, you're commanded to do that. But the problem is the scriptural command for worship doesn't end there. There's not just private worship. There is public worship. And you cannot read the New Testament. Without understanding, God calls us as brothers and sisters to worship him together, corporately, publicly, as his kingdom, as a church. The Bible commands it and commit, uh, commends both private and public worship. Now here at Watermark, our worship is not perfect. Uh, we try to do things just as right as we can do them. It's not perfect. We don't hit a home run every Sunday. Uh, we make it easy for people to come. We welcome people. I believe our church is a very friendly church. We welcome people. We accept people. We're very casual here. I think we make it easy for people to come through our doors and worship God here. I think it, we make it pretty easy to do that. And here at Watermark, we try, and I said this last Sunday, to appeal to the intellect first. We're not highly emotional in our worship. Emotions are fine. God created emotions. And if you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. If you want to say amen, say amen. That's fine. But we try to appeal to the intellect first and then the emotions. And I think that's the way it should be done. I want you to think first. Think first. And then whatever emotions come out of that, that's a good thing questions that we ask. What do I want in worship? And that question drives most decisions about where people go to church. What do I want in worship? What do I want? And that drives our decisions. Perhaps a better question is what does God want in worship? What does God want? This verse in Hebrews, and I studied this thing I mean, it's kind of a shake, it shakes you up a little bit. Worship in a way that's pleasing to God. Worship in a way that pleases God. So what does he want? Another question to ask, is Jesus worthy of our worship? Is Jesus worthy of it? And we covered that last Sunday. I gave you just four or five things last Sunday that I believe from Scripture prove that Jesus is worthy of our worship. He created us. He crea Jesus created. Jesus owns everything. He sustains everything. He has paid for everything. And he forgives it all. He forgives everything for those of us who come to him by faith. So think about that. He is the creator. He's the owner. He's the sustainer. He paid for everything. And he forgives everything. Everything in its totality. I believe that makes him worthy of worship. 
He's worthy of private worship. He's worthy of public worship. And we forget that Jesus wants all of us. He has saved our spirits. He has made us new creatures, but he, he wants our souls and he wants our bodies. And we will always fail at giving him that 100% because we're humans. But it should be a goal to surrender more and more of my life to Jesus Christ. And I know growing up, many of you remember, there's no hymn we used to sing. Usually during the invitation at the end of a service when we were growing up, it was called, I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Now that's an easy song to sing. It's a hard song to live. And there is not one there is not one, there's not one of you, there was not, neither I, there was not one person that has ever sung that song that truly meant it. I know it's sung with good intentions. We sing a contemporary song here about the same thing. Uh, it's a different name, but it goes along with the same thing of surrendering everything. And I believe we have good intentions when we say I surrender all. I believe our hearts are... Motives are good and we have good intentions. But none of us, A, want to surrender everything to Jesus. We don't want to. And two, we never have and we never will in this life. But it ought to be a goal. Because doing that would, it change our lives, man. What if you surrendered everything? all your money to Jesus? What if you surrendered your family to Jesus? What if you surrendered your, just your Sunday mornings? If you just said, Jesus, you own my Sunday mornings. I wonder what that would look like for you for the next year. Great words, good intentions, I just don't really mean that. And let's just be honest about it, okay? Can you say amen? Let's just be honest about it. But Jesus wants our soul and body. He possesses our spirit. He owns our spirit. He has made our spirits perfect in him. And now he longs to change and transform our souls, change and transform our bodies to honor him. So in Hebrews 12, 28, he says, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This, this mention of a kingdom, and this is a heavy verse here. He says, we're in the process of receiving a kingdom. Theologians call this the now and the not yet. If you're a Christian, you are in the kingdom of God already. The kingdom of God has already come. The kingdom of God is operating, I believe, in the world today. I believe that. But it's now and not yet. It's here, but it's not here. <laughs> We're here, but the whole kingdom hasn't come yet. It will one day. But we're to live like kingdom people. He says, so we, we're receiving this kingdom. And let me be clear with you. You and I are either in this kingdom or we're not. You are either part of the kingdom of God or you are not. I grew up under preaching, and I'm really hesitating to say what I'm about to say. I grew up under preaching where almost every Sunday the preacher would say, most church members aren't even saved. Most of our church members aren't. People in the pews aren't even saved. I mean, I heard that a lot. You know, they, they said that a lot. You know, our church folk, no wonder the church is powerless. Half the people in it aren't saved. And I heard that so much that I got tired of hearing it, and I don't say that much, uh, you know. But it's really been on your pastor's spirit in these last several months. Things like the words of Jesus, who said, you will know them by their fruits. You will know who belongs to me by the fruit they produce. And I know we're bordering on judgmentalism now. Amen? We're, we're bordering, we're bordering on judging. 
But Jesus said, you will know who belongs to me because the fruit of their life will, will show it. All through the New Testament, there is this constant encouragement to grow, to be a disciple, to change, to transform, to look more like Jesus, act more like Jesus, forgive more like Jesus, talk more like Jesus, be more like Jesus. And you see such little of that transformation in church. And I'm not going to get up and preach on it every Sunday, but I do agree with my old fathers in preaching ministry that I do believe a lot of our church folk just don't know Jesus. Because worship's not important to them. Church is not important to them. The Bible is not important to you. Service is not important to you. Generosity, all the things the Bible teaches, it's not important to you. Do you know Jesus? That's really been on my heart lately. You will know them by their fruits. And if there's no fruit, they don't know me. He wants us all. We're in this kingdom. You're either in it or you're not. Now, he says, we're receiving a kingdom. If there's a kingdom, then there is a king. If you're part of this kingdom, you ain't the king. If there's a kingdom, there is a king, and you and I are not the king. You and I are not the king the king. We don't call the shots. We don't tell the king what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. You don't do that. And he says, this kingdom that cannot be shaken. And I'd love to talk about that word shaken for a while, but we'll hurry on. He says, then as, as we realize we're part of this kingdom, let us be thankful and literally, that term in the Greek there is literally, let us have grace. Let us have grace. But it was an idiom used in the first century that was actually kind of translated, be thankful. It was an idiom that was used, kind of a, a phrase that was used when, when somebody said that, let us have grace. It, it was perhaps like saying grace before a meal. We're thankful for this. And he says, be thankful Give thanks because gratitude is inextricably connected to worship. And then he says, and so worship God. And so worship God. I read that as a command, not a suggestion. There's no qualifiers before it other than you're in the either, either in the kingdom or you're not. So since you're in the kingdom, since you say you're in the kingdom, since you say Jesus is your king, so since you place yourself in that kingdom, worship God. That's a command. Worship God. Worship the king. And then he tells us how to do it. Worship God acceptably with reverence. That's the, the how. How do we worship God with reverence? That's simply acknowledging the greatness of God. That's what I tried to do here last Sunday. Jesus created it all, paid it all, sustains it all, owns it all, forgave it all. With reverence is just reverencing what, who he is and what he has done. Reverence doesn't mean you have to be quiet and all the time. Doesn't mean you always have to keep it, you know, burn candles and incense and be weird. No, no, no. It's just a, an attitude of reverence. You are before the most holy God, not just in church, but 24 hours a day. You're constantly in front of a holy God. Reverence. In fact, Interesting story, if you want to go back and read it, in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi in chapter 1, <clears throat> in Malachi, God launches a series of indictments against Israel, a series of indictments against them. And in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, you have not reverenced me. 
you've not honored me as God. I'm God, you're not. You have not honored me. You have not reverenced me. And of course, they came back as we humans do who never do anything wrong and said, in what way have we not reverenced you? And I think that's the same thing most of us would ask. Well, how have I not reverenced God? I'm in church today. I've been good. Read Malachi 1. We reverence him. Then he says, with, with reverence and awe. The word awe is connected to kind of a sense of mystery. He is the creator, we're the creature. He is infinite, we are finite. He is powerful, we are not powerful. Everything we aren't, he is. He is all-knowing, I am not. He is righteous, I am not. He executes perfect justice, I don't. He forgives completely. We're not real good at that. He is everything I'm not. And that ought to cause in us a sense of awe, a sense of mystery that we are dealing with one who, yes, he came to earth. He wrapped himself up in human flesh. He became us. Real blood flowed through his veins. He became a man. And John says we touched him, we heard him, we hung out, we rubbed shoulders with him. Yes, God became flesh and dwelt among us. But let's not preach that to the point we forget. He is still God. He's God. And don't limit your view of God to just the Jesus part that we see on the earth. He is the infinite. He is the omnipotent. He is the creator. He is the all-powerful. He is the reason you and I are breathing at this moment. And should he decide to change his mind, any of us could just stop breathing right now. He controls it all. This is the one with whom we have to do. All. And I understand the spirit behind it. But let me tell you something. Jesus ain't your homeboy. Okay? He's not your best buddy. I understand the spirit and talk behind that. I, I get it. Jesus is God. He is God. He was here before the world was. He spoke it into existence. He sustains it. He keeps it. He owns it. If I have any hope of forgiveness and mercy and redemption, if I have any hope of missing the wrath of God and obtaining grace, it is by him and him alone. And he is worthy of my worship, privately and publicly. Reverence. Oh, and I understand with the breakdown of our social institutions and distinctions today, I understand how hard this is. I understand in the breakdown of our culture of authority and nobody's uh, in authority anymore. And my opinion is just as, just as important as yours. I got news for you. My opinion about rocket science is not as important as the opinion of a rocket scientist. And no, if you do not know what you're talking about, your opinion doesn't matter. Thank you, had one amen. I think it was from my wife. Thank you, sweetie. You got my bag, don't you? If you don't know what you're talking about, your opinion doesn't mean anything. Well, I think God... It doesn't matter what you think about God. It doesn't matter. And we live in this day where social, you know, let's, let, let me just say, I know, I'm a, I know I'm an old fogey. I just turned 56. I know, I know. But we live in a world that no longer respects authority. Granted, authority has done some dastardly things. I get that. And I'm going to start with preachers. Preachers don't get the respect they used to. Now, again, some of us lost that respect. I get that. But preachers aren't looked up to anymore. Teachers have lost a lot of their authority. Politicians, well, they earn the loss of it. Let's keep moving. Uh, but, but we don't, you know, 
we've got people who don't know anything about anything vomiting opinions that are worthless in our culture today. And I've said this often. You know, and I wonder how many of you would say that. I look back now, I thought my dad was a blowhard. I thought he just was stupid. He didn't know anything. He was, my dad wasn't cool. If I had my life to live over again, I would have done 98% of what my dad said because I've learned my lesson. If I'd have done what my dad told me to do with my money, I wouldn't be here this morning. I'd be in Aruba. I'm serious. If I'd have managed my money the way dad told me to, I'd be, you wouldn't have to pay me today. I, 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 I'd be fine. But I, I was so smart back then, you see. If I'd have done a lot of things my dad tried to tell me, my life would have been a lot different. Oh, but see, I, I was 22 and knew it all. Now, I'm not preaching against young people. That's not what I'm doing. We have 60-year-olds that won't listen to expert advice and intelligent discussion. So why am I saying all that? That, that type, that's the culture we live in where nobody respects anybody anymore. Nobody's really willing to learn and listen anymore. Everybody just wants to blab, blab, blab their own crap. And I think that bleeds into how we look at God. We've removed him from his authority. We've pulled him down. We think, my, I, I think my point, why well, my opinion's just as good as what's written in the Bible. Who is God to tell me? He's God. I've heard people say that. Well, who is God? Who is, what, what is the Bible to tell? It's the Bible. It's God. He has every right to tell you. Oh, and he says our God's a consuming fire. That's an interesting place. He indicates God's character that does not change. He, this is a, read that whole chapter. This is connected to Mount Sinai in Deuteronomy 4.14. And Moses said this, our God is a consuming fire. And when they were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, that was a perfect illustration for them. God is a consuming fire. But in this context, it literally means he's just saying God doesn't change. He was awesome back then. He's awesome today. And he will be awesome in eternity. You're not God then. You're not God now. You are not, or never will be God. He is God. He is God. He's the authority. He doesn't serve you. You serve him. That was my introduction. I'm going to do these quick, quick things as quick as I possibly So if we're coming to worship, see, you, ne you need to know the person with whom we're dealing here. Yes, he's your friend. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he's given you mercy. Yes, he's given you grace. Yes, he sustains you. Yes, you are precious in his sight. Yes, 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 you are the apple of his eye. But he is God. He's God, and he deserves and demands our worship if we claim to be part of his kingdom. So number one, let me just give you hopefully some applicable helps here. Number one, characteristics that might help us in worship. Number one, our worship should be accurate. It should be accurate. Now, it never will be perfect. We're human beings. God understands that. It should be accurate. And again, I go back to when people come to before God, they say, well, I like to think of God as a heavenly grandpa with a long beard and whose lap I can sit. Or I like to think God of, I like to think of God as a, you know, just a nice fluffy Santa Claus that gives me presents. The best description of what anyone ever thought God should be is in the great, Great classic intellectual movie, Talladega Nights. 
And you remember the scene at the table when that guy's describing what he would like Jesus to look like. Remember that scene? I forgot the actor's name. But, but remember he was just, I like to picture Jesus as a, a guy with a t-shirt, tuxedo t-shirt on in, in the front row of a Leonard Skinner concert. Yeah. We laugh at that, but that's the way most of us think about God. He created us in his image, but we try to make him into ours. It must be accurate. And people who say, I like to think of God as, and then they give their own idea, that's nothing but idolatry. Our vision of God must line up with the biblical description of God. In John 4, 23, Jesus said, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, there's been two bold statements in this message today. Some of you are thinking much more than that. There's at least two bold statements. Hebrews says that God's a consuming fire. It says that there is a way to worship that pleases God. So apparently there's a way that displeases him. And then this statement here, Jesus said, those that worship will do it in spirit and truth, for they're the kind of worshipers the Father's looking for. The Father's looking for people who worship him in spirit, our perfected spirits maybe, in passion, Maybe with, with, with energy, sure, but with truth. There's a lot of churches, there's a lot of pastors this morning that are jumping up and down on platforms and running to and fro, and they've yanked their ties off and thrown their coats off and unbuttoned their shirts, and they're jumping up and down. They're hollering and screaming. They're red in the face, and they're sweating, and they're just hollering and screaming. Everybody's up, amen, and there's a lot of spirit there, but there's no truth. There's no truth. Spirit without truth is not worship. Truth without spirit is not worship. He said spirit and truth. That's who the Father's looking for. It means to worship God as he is truly revealed in the Bible. Worship must be based on who God is as revealed in Scripture and not who I've created him to be. So when we worship, let's be as accurate as we humans can be when it comes to viewing God. He's God. He's God. Isaiah saw him in the temple in Isaiah 6. and Isaiah fell down in front of him and said, I'm a sinner. I'm lost, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. The publican in Jesus' story saw God and hit himself in the chest and said, God, have mercy on me. When Paul and Silas were in jail, The jailer saw the work of God, the power of God through Paul and Silas and the jailer fell to his knees and said, man, what have I got to do to be saved? Understand who it is we're dealing with. He's God. He's God. He is the God before whom each of us will stand one day. And to whom each of us, he will say, either, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Enter and enjoy the joys of the Lord. Or to whom he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. He's God. He's God. And we're privileged. We get to come right, we get to barge right into his presence. He actually lives in us. Wow. In the Old Testament, in the temple, there was a little room called the Holy of Holies. 
where God's presence resided with the Ark of the Covenant. His presence lived between the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant, symbolic. And only the priests could go in there. And then only one time a year into the presence of God. And then he had to make sure all the proper sacrifices were made and that he had on all the proper vestments and everything was to God's order and God's liking and God's demand. And he could only go in there once a year and he could only go in there if his sins had been dealt with. And they would tie a rope with a cowbell to the priest's leg that if they heard the bell quit, ringing while he was ministering in there. They knew his sins had not been atoned for and he would die in the presence of God and they'd drag him out. Now through Jesus, you and I have the presence of God living in us. Oh, how gracious. Oh, how marvelous. But don't for a moment think that that presence is not, is no longer as awesome and should be revered like it used to be. He's still God. It should be accurate. Be biblical in your worship. Secondly, our worship should be authentic. Again, Jesus said in John 4, 23, worship me in spirit. There is a sense of authenticity there. Our spirit, uh, most theologians believe he's not talking about the Holy Spirit there. It's small s. Worship in spirit. Worship from the heart. Re worship from your belly. Worship from the deepest recesses of who you are. Worship out of the spirit that God has made right in Jesus Christ. Worship out of your spirit. Worship is our, our spirit responding to God. Now here's a good question. When worship is taking place and your spirit is not responding, you may still have a corrupt spirit. You may not know Jesus. Because lost people don't enjoy worship. It involves the soul. We've put this chart up here many times, not today, but the soul, the body, and the spirit. Worship involves the soul. In the soul, there is the mind, the intellect. Worship involves the mind. Worship is not mindless. Worship is not falling down backwards on the floor and going into some mystical trance-like state where you shiver and shudder and foam at the mouth and do all this weird stuff we see. That's not worship. That's mysticism. That's idolatry. That's not worship. It involves the mind. You can't worship unless the mind has been engaged. It starts in the mind. Will is involved in the soul. And we can't force your will. No one can force your will. You make your decisions. But there is a, a will. There is a decision to make. Am I going to worship God privately? You must make a decision. Am I going Sunday? Am I going to make plans to be at church Sunday and worship publicly? That is a decision you make. It's your will, and nobody forces you to do that. That's your decision. And then in the soul, it is the emotions too. Yes, mind, will, and emotions all involved in worship. Some people are highly emotional. Some aren't. Just be who you are and don't fake it. Again, if you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to say amen, say amen. Hallelujah. Do it. But you just be you. I would warn you, us, to be careful what moves you in worship. This is an interesting comment I read. We, one of the biggest hindrances to worship is yourself. Because we tend to respond to who God is by a musical tone or a preaching tone rather than by the mere fact of who he is. Songs are good. They lead us. Lyrics are great. They, they lead us. Preaching is great. <laughs> it leads us and it teaches us. But first and foremost, we must be enamored not with the music, not with the preaching, but with who God is. It is who God is 
out of which these other things come. <clears throat> but we make worship about myself, my interests, my worries. What are others going to think? What am I here to get this morning? So worship should be authentic. It should just be real. Just be real. Thirdly, worship should be attentive. Attentive. Four times Jesus commanded us to love God with all our mind. That was part of it. Even the Old Testament, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He commanded that. And again, it's in reference to the mind, the place where you can focus, the place where you drill down, the place where things come together first in the mind. And worship should be attentive, focused, publicly and privately. All of Catholic worship and much of Protestant worship is simply mindless repetition. Just mindless repetition. Saying the same things over and over and over. God is not pleased with the thoughtless singing of songs. I know we're not all singers. I've heard you. We're not all singers. And, and some people just, music's not their thing. And I respect that. I get that. Music's just not your thing. It's okay. But somehow our faith has always been a singing faith. Christianity's just always been a singing faith. But some people, the singing part just doesn't connect. That, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But we who do sing, just the thoughtless singing of songs is not pleasing to God. Just mouthing the words, not listening to the words. And I think I love old hymns. I, I grew up on hymns. The first hymn I ever played, my mom bought me a 1956 version of the Baptist hymnal. I still have it when I was five years old. The first hymn I ever played in my life, do y'all remember this hymn? Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Savior died at Calvary. Remember that one? First hymn I ever played was straight out of the 56 Baptist hymnal. I love hymns. But I do think because we sang them so much, so much time, so much repetition, so much of the same words over and over and over and over, you could watch in Baptist churches where I grew up, people stand there like this. They're singing, you know. They're mouthing the words, but the words no longer connected. And so we wrote contemporary music. Now, since we've gotten away from him some, I enjoy going back and taking an old hymn now because it's fresh and new to me. We sang He Hides my, Hideth My Soul the other Sunday here. We incorporate old hymns. We jazz them up a bit maybe, but the words are awesome. But too much of it becomes repetition, monotonous, and mundane. And worship can happen like that. So when we sing, look at the words. That even if you don't sing, pay attention to the words. God is not happy with the perfunctory praying of cliches, our prayers. I've always called it the Baptist deacon's prayer. You've heard it. Contains every Christian cliche that's ever been uttered. God, we pray us today that thou wouldest help us our churches to be a lighthouse on a hillist. Remember? And God, help all the poor starving kids in Africa. And God, help us as we go out into the highways and byways of life. It's just nothing but repeated prayers he's heard from somebody else. It's not passionate. It's not truth. It's not worship or prayer and spirit and truth. It's just the mere parenting of prayers that's been heard before and prayed before. Cliches. Learn to pray in a different way. Learn to use new words in worship. He is not honored with the careless explanation. Explan ex He's not happy. Oh, hush. <laughs> Exclamations of praise the Lord. If you say praise the Lord, 
let it come out of spirit and truth. If you say hallelujah, let it come out of spirit and truth. If you say amen, let it come out of a a heart of spirit and truth. Jesus actually called this in Matthew 6, vain repetitions. That's what he calls it when you say the same perfunctory thing over and over and over again. It loses its power. It loses its meaning. It's not spirit. It's not truth. It's lost it. And he said, you don't come to God with vain repetitions, just meaningless, mindless phrases. Focus on what's going on here and now. Now I know this is hard, and I'm with you on this. But smartphones have hurt our worship. Now I'm all for them. I own one, going to keep owning one, going to keep paying a thousand dollars for them. Good Lord. Uh, I'm all for the technology, and you do a lot of good. Some of you look at your Bible and read your Bible on a smartphone. No problem. That's cool. That's great. No problem. But it has sure contributed to the inattentiveness of our society. You can't have a meeting anymore. One of these days, I'm going to actually build me a soapbox right here. I'm going to actually build me one and get up on it when I'm preaching on soapbox issues. You can't even have a meeting anymore without a cell phone interruption. Not an emergency. (laughs) You know, the kid's arm didn't get cut off. We've kind of had a rule with our kids. Unless you've cut something off, and if it's not coming out one end or the other, leave us alone. Amen? Well, ain't good parenting. Yeah, you do it your way. 99% of the meetings that get disturbed by cell phones, you didn't need to take the call. Y'all sure are quiet. This inattentiveness, not just to worship, but to life, to friends. I heard about a great idea some people had. When they get together to eat, they all put their, out in a restaurant, they all put their cell phones in a basket in the middle of the table, and whoever picks up a cell phone first has to pay. (laughs) Amen? So we have a huge problem with this out there, but it it bleeds into worship. And I'm not against all that. Please, I, I... I'm I'm being compassionate here, but understand, we need to focus on what we're doing here. Forget your shopping list. Forget about where you're going to eat in a little bit. Forget about it. Let's worship the Almighty God. I was so worried last Sunday. I was a nervous wreck last Sunday. I absolutely was. All week last week, We had squirrels in this auditorium. (laughs) We had squirrels in here. Two or three. And I'd come in and they'd just be, and they made themselves at home. (laughs) One was up on that cross all week long. I almost just got out my gun. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I kept calling people and telling them they never did anything. Um, But finally, a couple of our guys call me I don't, Friday, I guess. He said, just let you know we got the squirrels. And I said, great. He said, we patched up. We found where they're coming in. But I was a nervous wreck last Sunday because I knew if a squirrel ran across here, we'd just have to go home. <laughs> we would do nothing else beyond that but go home. Just go. And I was prepared for that. We just dismiss, go home. But he calls me, and um, he said, we found the squirrels. He said, a couple of them are dead. And if you get close up here, you can smell it. If you go back in the back, you can really smell it. But I am told that one of them was dead right here. Right here. So one was dead. And I'm going to tell you who said this. One of the guys that called me said, looks like your preaching last Sunday killed him. (laughs) I won't tell you who it was, but let me make a church announcement. Lanier Burford is no longer a member of our church. Be engaged. Ladies and gentlemen, I preach long, but listen, all we have together every week is an hour and a half. Don't waste it. 
That's all we got together. That's all the church of Jesus Christ at Watermark has every week. That's the only time we all get together. That's all we got. An hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. That's all we got. Don't waste it every Sunday. Be engaged. Then finally, worship should be active. In the Old Testament, God pleasured in sacrifices of worship. The, the goats and the, the uh, turtle doves and the sheep and all, God pleasured in that. It was a way that sinful people could come and worship him and stand before him because all of them foretold of the coming of Jesus. In the New Testament, God pleasures in sacrifices, but not of goats and rams and turtle doves. Jesus took care of all that on the cross. We don't have to do that anymore. Jesus is our sacrifice. But the Bible says that Jesus still pleasures in the sacrifices of worship. And in the New Testament, they're talked about like this. They are the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the offering of thanksgiving, like the writer in Hebrew said, the offering of thanksgiving. Jesus is, he takes pleasure when we are thankful together in worship. You brought us through another week. You provided, you protected. It might have been rough. The storm may have come, but boy, Sunday morning we woke up and we're still breathing. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. The sacrifice of praise is mentioned in the New Testament. The sacrifice of humility, coming before him, knowing who he is and who we are. The sacrifice of repentance from everything in our lives that do, don't, that that is contrary to his will for our lives. The offerings and sacrifices, yes, of money, prayer, serving others, all of those things are bound up in New Testament worship. Paul said in Romans 12, 1, offer your bodies, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What is worship? Paul just defined it. Offering my body is a living sacrifice. There's the definition of it right there. And that starts in my mind. It works through my will and my emotions and executes itself through my body. Worship should be active. Bowing down in worship leads to rising up in obedience. And that's the word I'm talking about here. Be obedient. Worship calls on obedience. Be obedient. Well, I'm obedient in my heart. Well, it's going to come out in your flesh. Some would say, well, preacher, you know, we're not going to be able to be there, but I'll be with you in spirit. You know what that means, don't you? You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. It means nothing. It means nothing. It means nothing because worship is expressed through the body. It's expressed through the body. Again, good intentions, I know, but it means nothing. Bowing down in worship leads us to rising up in obedience. Be obedient. Let me say this real quickly, and I know I've, I need to stop, but let me say this. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He created it. He created everything. He owns everything. He sustains everything. He paid for everything. He, he forgives everything. He is worthy of our worship. We're dealing with God here. Our worship should be accurate, biblical. It should be authentic, real. It should be attentive, engaging, focused, and it should be active, obedient. And then our worship sometimes, again, we suffer from, a, from an American consumerism where we want everything the way I want it. And it's just sometimes amazing at the response of people who don't get what they want. Oh, you can always tell a lot about a person how they respond when they don't get what they want. But I just want to remind you, worship in America is very easy. It's so easy. It's so easy. First, you have the choice whether you come in or not. It's your choice. It's so easy. 
for most people in America, when they decide to come, they come to an air-conditioned building with padded seats. Coffee, donuts, cool preacher. American worship is so easy. I mean, how hard can this be? We don't start early. If you think 10.30 is early, you and I need to talk. We don't even start early. Let me tell you something. I, if I could get y'all to go along with it, I'd much rather have worship at 8.30 on Sunday morning and have the rest of Sunday. I would. I would. But for you lazy heads, we've got to have it at 10.30. Uh, and I don't get my way about that. Um, it's not even early. It's not even early. It is so easy to worship in America. And because it's so easy, here's what we complain about. I couldn't find a parking place. The building was too cold. It was too hot. You better be grateful we got a building. Music was too loud. Preacher preached too long. That's legitimate. Preacher preached too long. Even I'll go as far as this. Well, they just weren't too friendly. Well, maybe you're not friendly. You think about all that criticism you hear from people about churches. America is the easiest country on this planet to worship in. Would you remember that? And Watermark's probably the easiest church around to be a member of. Go study the church in China. Christianity is illegal in China. They have what they call secret church there. Read how they have to worship today. For a Chinese church to meet, they don't have all this. They meet in homes. And hear how it's normally done. They, can't, they have to stay off the radar from the government. So they pick a night to meet. And people will start arriving in the home 12 to 15 hours before that, one at a time, as to not draw attention to that house. So by the time they actually start sit down together and open a Bible, some of them have been there 8, 10, 12, 15 hours already. Not everybody there even has a copy of the Bible. And again, this isn't 100 years ago. This is today. So I want you to leave this morning knowing how easy you have it. This ain't no sacrifice, folks. This isn't hard. I'm so tired. I stayed out late last night. Well, go to bed. Go home and go to bed. Amen? Your will, your decision. Well, stop. Well, I've had such a busy week. You and a hundred other people. Amen? You want to see my schedule from this past week? I just got so much going on. Really? Really? That, that's what you're going with. I got a lot going on. And I guarantee you, if I came back 10 years from now to you and said, how you doing, you would say the same thing. I got a lot going on. Your whole life is, I got a lot going on. I used to work with a guy. Every time you said, how you doing, he said, oh, I run around like my head's on fire. Well, you're stupid. Get control of your life. Get some discipline. Make some better decisions. You don't have to live like that. Well, you know, we've just been so busy. Too busy to corporately worship the most high God.
I hope you come back next week. I'm asking you humbly as your pastor and hopefully as your friend, will you make corporate worship more prominent in your agenda? Would you make this more prominent in your agenda? I'm not asking for your firstborn. Don't want them. Today, I'm not asking for more money. We'll do that next week. Not asking for a bigger salary. Not asking for you to paint walls or clean floors or empty trash cans around here. Kill squirrels. Not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to make this Sunday morning at 1030 a more prominent part of your calendar. So uh, one thing that uh, happens, you know, Jack gave me the opportunity to do the announcements. He probably regrets that sometimes. So I'm going to ask Jack if he would come up here just a second. You can keep I'm really talking. regretting it now. <laughs> you know, we're, we're fortunate to have the type of pastor that we do and the, uh, the word that he brings to us every week. And again, October is, is Pastor Appreciation Month, in case uh, some of y'all don't know that. I think everybody did knows that. But, uh, so we wanted to recognize Jack uh, as, our, as our pastor. But when you think of a, of a preacher, probably a lot of different things come to, to, come to your mind. I mean, you think of him as a teacher, a preacher, a pastor, a, a comforter, a, a complaint department. Whatever the case may be, and you know, a, a pastor has has to play a lot of different roles in a church, and uh, again, especially a church our size. And so, we just thought it was important. There's there's a, a verse that I wanted to, to share with you out of Jeremiah. I think when I when I talk to a lot of people in our church, this sort of represents one of the main points we see out of Jack uh, in his preaching. And so, I will give your shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. I mean, I hear that a lot from the congregation, just as teaching and preaching um, and making it where we can understand it as a congregation. And again, we just wanted to recognize Jack for his efforts. Believe it or not, he's been here 15 years this year as well. Um, so we, we've got a, a pastor. So on behalf of, from your congregation, we've got a card here for you, along with some other stuff in it. It says, you rock. <laughs> uh, and again, everybody has signed about everybody, mm -hmm. just just a shout out to say thanks. Wow, thank you from, so uh, much. Your, your congregation you. here. Thank you. And, and we know... We Bruce, know, I see your ex. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> we know you rock too, but we'd well, be remiss we didn't mention Melissa because yep. he may rock, but she's the rock. Yeah. That, that uh, keeps That's him true. going. So we thank, thank you, Melissa. So again, you want know, to... If, if don't talk to him very often. Stick around today and, and tell him thanks uh, for what he does and Melissa for what they do for our church. And uh, again, um, I'll, I'll, Melissa, you grab this and uh, y'all can uh, share it for us. It's just a gift from the uh, church. Thank here, so. you so All much. All right. I think that speaks more to y'all's patience over the years than it does to me putting up with me. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Very, very great. Thank you.